hope you're all really well. Uh, this is, I think, week 656 million of lockdown, also known as Lesson 12 of Natural Hazards. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that we're near the end of term. We've got this lesson and one next week. And then as far as I'm aware, it's a six week summer holiday. Although that being said, those of you who haven't done the work, I would highly recommend that you do try and catch up on everything. Watch the PowerPoints that you've not seen. Uh, do the quizzes online. They will all still be there. We're not going to shut anything down off ePraise and Teams until uh, the right at the very end of August. But also some of you who've done absolutely brilliantly, you deserve a holiday. Uh, and, you know, when I say done brilliant, I don't necessarily mean doing all the work. Some of you've done all sorts of things. You've kept family things going. You've been baking. You've been tidying. You've been cooking. You've been cleaning. Some of you maybe even have just become the world's greatest expert on the Xbox. Uh, but well done for keeping going. And uh, according to the plans from the DFE yesterday, we will all be back in September. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you all then. So a um, bit of a starter activity. Uh, a few lessons ago, we did some work on Haiti. Uh, I think it was lesson four. So if you haven't done it and just want to make sure you can go back or if you just need a quick recap, go back to the one on lesson four uh, or you can have a quick look on Google and check what is correct. I want you to read the next paragraph on the next slide and I want you to have a look and anything where it talks about the causes. So what made that uh, earthquake happen, you highlight in green. Anything that is about the effects, so how people were impacted, colour in blue. Anything about the responses is yellow. And any fact that is inaccurate, I want you to colour in red. And also, any fact that is then inaccurate, what I want you then to do is to rewrite it, and I want you to tell me what the answer should be. So. Let's have a look at the paragraph. It says on January the 12th, 2011, Haiti was devastated by a massive earthquake. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, which also has a history of seismic activity. Devastating earthquakes were recorded there in 1751, 1770, 1842 and 1946. The island of Hispaniola, which Haiti shares with the Dominican Republic, lies mostly between two large tectonic plates, the North American and the Nazca. The plate margin is a conservative plate margin. The country's poverty means that the infrastructure and emergency services were not prepared to handle the effects of a natural disaster. It was estimated that over 30,000 people died, about 1 million lost their homes, were displaced, and many of the deaths were from secondary effects such as diseases, namely Ebola. Aid organisations around the world raced to help in search and rescue, provide food, shelter and medicines, and 10 years later are still helping to rebuild the infrastructure. So in a moment, put yourself on pause. You need the four colours, cause, effect, responses and the accuracies. And remember to write out what the inaccuracies were. So put yourself on pause now. So you've had a go at this. Um, I haven't done the colour coding for you, uh, but what I have done is let's just see if you've got the inaccurate pieces of information. So I'm hoping that the first one you've got is the date. It was in fact 2010. The next one was the plates. It is the North America and the Caribbean plate, not the Nazca plate. The Nazca plate is right by South America in the Pacific Ocean. It wasn't a conservative plate margin, it was a destructive subduction zone. And not 30,000 people died, but 300,000 people. And I'm hoping you've guessed the last one, because there were five errors. The last one, it wasn't Ebola that people died from, it was cholera. So well done if you've got those correct. So moving on then to what the title of today's lesson is, I want us to think about can we manage the risk of living in tectonic areas? Last lesson, uh, you were looking at why people live in tectonic areas. So you looked at farming and mining and tourism, uh, the geothermal, the sort of heat and energy that was supplied and the fact that people have got family and friends there. So we know that people are going to live here. What we need to think about, though, is how we can manage that risk, because everyone doesn't just walk around going, well, it's going to happen to me doom and gloom and if I live I live and if I die I die 
we can actually try to do something about it. So we're going to look at planning, preparing and predicting. We're going to explain how different areas have maybe managed to adapt to live in these. And we're going to think about the effectiveness of these strategies and what you think would be the best one. So just to see where this fits in, you can see here in our circle that we've been looking at each week, we are now in that final circle of living in hazardous areas. So basically, is this all we can do about earthquakes? Hide under our desks. And I'm kind of hoping that there is a little bit more to it than this. If we look here, this here is some training that goes on in Japan every single year. On the 1st of September, every single year, uh, it's actually a date that uh, is in memory of a previous major earthquake. They have a disaster day and they basically all practice, like we have our fire drills, they have major um, earthquake drills. And the people on the left with these VR uh, headsets on, what they're doing is they're actually imagining that they're in a scene. And these people have come from all around the world. Uh, because Japan is sort of a leading expert on how people can actually prepare for these disasters. So this is one way that they actually try to help prepare people. Uh, the children there, they're sort of um, being protected. Um, I, to be honest with you, I'm not 100% certain why they have those head, headsets on. Maybe you can research and have a look and get back to me on that. And then the bottom picture, uh, this here is about uh, them just practicing rescuing people uh, so again, just setting up drills so that, that they're ready for a major disaster. Everybody knows what their job is and people don't walk around running around and saying, I don't know what to do because that's actually more dangerous. OK, so what we have got is those three P's that I talked about. We have got prediction, protection and planning. And these here are all important. Uh, if we take protection first, this is actions taken before an earthquake to reduce its impact. Prediction is attempt to forecast an event where and when it will happen based on our current knowledge. And planning, identifying and avoiding places most at risk from earthquakes. Um, and for those of you who want to, there is actually a map that you can look at. And this is based in Japan. And they basically put into zones and say that these are the areas that we think are going to be at greatest risk. So it just means that they know that should there be um, an earthquake, they've got an idea of where they should be trying to head first, because those are the areas that are going to be the greatest problem. Um, back in the 1990s, a city called Kobe had a major earthquake. And I think I talked about this before when we looked at earthquakes. And one of the reasons that people died, so many, was because they were living in the part of the city that was built before 19, I want to say 1980, because at that point was when they said that all new buildings had to be earthquake proof uh, or able to withstand a certain magnitude of earthquakes. So the older part of the city with really heavy roof tiles collapsed and people suffocated. Uh, what made worse was that they also, the gas pipes, uh, cracked, so gas was escaping, electricity cables came down, sparks created fires, and then the um, water supplies, because the pipes had burst, the water supplies then weren't able to get to where they needed to be because the water was just leaking everywhere. And so the fire brigade, one, couldn't reach the people because the roads were blocked where the buildings had collapsed, and secondly, uh, they couldn't then put the fires out because the water pipes had all burst. So the reason they have this map is that in Japan, they know where the old parts of the city are, where the narrow streets are and all of those. So they're already thinking about that in advance. But these are all very different because some of these are about what you do before there's an earthquake or volcano. And some of these are about what you do afterwards. So. You should find that there is a Word document. I've also put it on a PDF for you that has um, a lot of statements. And these statements I need you to have ready because you're going to do something as we go through these activities with them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is prediction. And this is quite important because it helps people to become aware in advance that there may soon be an earthquake or volcanic eruption. Now, the difficulty is, is that earthquakes, we can know where they are most likely to happen but they're harder to predict the exact time and date. Um, volcanoes are a little bit easier, and we'll, we'll talk about these differences in a moment. 
Just to give you an idea about prediction, how seriously some countries uh, take this, is if we take the first paragraph, in um, 2010, there was an earthquake in Italy. Uh, and parts of Italy are very, very old and historic, as you know, if you've done anything about the Romans, you know how old and historic parts of those, uh, those countries are. And sadly, uh, over 300 people died in this old part of the town. And people actually tried to uh, take to court the seismologists, the people whose job it is responsible for monitoring uh, tectonic events. And they charged them with manslaughter. And the reason that they were doing this was that they actually believed that they should have been able to uh, actually predict that this earthquake was going to happen. And originally, they were found uh, guilty. Uh, and then later on, they were actually what's called acquitted because there were so many protesters saying that it's impossible to do this. So some countries take this really, really seriously. People should be able to predict events. But what was really quite interesting is that the researchers uh, actually found out that there were certain things that actually happened. And they actually believed that, if anything, it was um, animals started to act differently. Uh, different gases happened. There were changes in the uh, groundwater chemistry. So they started to see there were things that they could use to predict that maybe an earthquake was imminent, not the exact date and time. So when we think about earthquake prediction, we sometimes call it monitoring as well, because that's really what we're doing. We're not able to predict exactly when it is, but by monitoring, we can watch and look for subtle changes. Now, I mentioned a moment ago about the animals are believed to act strangely. Um, there's things like um, snakes start to come out of the ground and um, they just said that when they sort of really start to look, they start to see some differences. Um, but what they do is they use various bits of technology and some of these technology that they use are things such as uh, the seismologists, the people that work with tectonics, they look for radon gas and the amount of gas starts to change, it starts to come out when there's going to be slight cracks forming in the Earth's surface. Uh, they also have really, really good seismometers that are able to look for tiny little uh, tremors or what they call foreshocks before the main earthquakes. Um, what they would do is they would earthquake locations and their times are matched, they start to spot patterns. So although they what they're doing is they're using historical models so they might see that there's been a particular place that had lots and lots of different earth tremors in a particular manner and then went on to have a bigger bigger earthquake and they can put that into a model so that when they look and see that an area is for showing something similar they can start to think that maybe something is about to happen and then what they use is they have um phones smartphones with gps receivers and accelerators built in and basically what these can do is uh, it's very, very clever, is you only get about 30 seconds warning. But actually, 30 seconds warning, so basically there'll be a slight tremor in the ground and that will link with a seismometer and the seismometer will then send a message up to space by satellite and back down to your mobile phone. Now, in that time, 30 seconds is enough time for you to maybe get some protection. Obviously, you're not going to be able to get out of a really high rise building, but imagine you're about to go and step inside a lift shaft and you don't want to be in a lift because that's one of the most dangerous places to be should there be um, an earthquake. So that lift, you can get off at the next floor. You're about to go in and suddenly your phone goes ping. You don't get into the lift. Uh, there are some buildings which we'll talk about buildings being protected later on, but some buildings will have lots and lots of glass and a shutter will come down automatically. Um, so that the glass doesn't fall out onto people in the street and kill them that way. So if there is some way that you can predict, then the shutters come down before that. Also, what's really important is the fire stations. Uh, the, if you imagine the fire station has the doors, you know, the automatic doors that go up. Well, I th in one of the earthquakes in Los Angeles, the ground shook so much that the frame of these doors just tilted at an angle. So when the doors went to go up, they jammed. So the fire brigade couldn't get out of the fire station to go and rescue people because the doors wouldn't open. So again, this warning system will work in advance where the doors will open up automatically. And in that 30 seconds, they can do quite a lot in terms of preparation. So that's new technology, things that, you know, when I was learning about this at school, this wasn't even thought about. No one even knew what a smartphone was. So huge changes. Volcanoes are slightly different. Volcanoes are easier to predict that there's going to be an eruption than there is an earthquake. And that's because they often give advance warning. You might not be able to predict the exact day and time that the eruption is going to happen, 
But what you can do is you can use technology to start to think, see things. And you've got that image um, at the very bottom there, and that shows some of the equipment, the technology that's being used. But basically, satellites will have a look and see, use something called tilt meters to look at the ground deformation. When some of the volcanoes are about to erupt, the mountain gets this enormous bulge where pressure's building up and the magma chamber is starting to force upwards and a volcano mountain will change shape. Now, it may only be by millimetres, but these tilt meters will be able to measure that. They also quite often have small earth tremors beforehand. And again, there'll be size monitors measuring these. If they start to see a sequence of these happening, they know there's something going on. As the magma starts to rise, the heat will increase. So again, if that temperature is beginning to change, both in the volcano surface or on the volcano surface and also in the surrounding water and streams, if that's increasing, then they know something's about to happen. And just like with the earthquakes, they start to look at um, changes in gases. So, for example, radon and this time sulfur gases as well are often released beforehand. So using these sorts of amounts of technology, they can predict that there might be a seismic event about to happen or a volcanic event about to happen. And that's called monitoring. So they're constantly watching these areas. So what I want you to do is that statements that I asked you to have out ready earlier, I'd like you to go through those statements and highlight in red all of those statements that you think relate to the prediction or monitoring of earthquakes and volcanoes. OK, so put yourself on pause whilst you do that. OK, so hopefully those are the statements that you have got there. So observing unusual animal behaviour, counting number of years behind between each uh, different previous event, changes in water pressure as well, historical records and seismographs. OK, so there's some things there. So moving on, then we have protection. And the idea of protection is the action we're going to take to reduce the impact. So the earthquake and volcano is happening. But what can we do to protect ourselves from it? Now, I mentioned earlier on that earthquakes are harder to predict than volcanoes. But actually, it's the opposite now in terms of protection. It is easier to protect yourself from an earthquake than it is from a volcano. And we'll look at why in just a moment. OK, so let's take our earthquakes first. Now, the biggest problem is uh, a lot of brick buildings, if they're built with bricks um, or have no reinforcement, they're actually easier to collapse. So a lot of brick buildings, which is a, t a traditional measure, uh, method of building things, will collapse. So what you need to try to do is, is make them earthquake resistant buildings. And if you look at that diagram on the right, here's some of the things that they have done. So they've got what's called computer controlled weights on roof to reduce movement. So the building doesn't move as much. Steel frames which sway with the earth movements. I mentioned before about the automatic window shutters to prevent falling glass. Outside of those buildings, you want to have open areas because when people are evacuated, they need somewhere to go, not be surrounded by more and more buildings. This idea of what's called a bird's cage interlocking steel frame, so it, it just makes it very, very rigid. And the outer panels are flexible as they attach. So if it's something's rigid, it's hard, uh, it, so it's easier to break. You actually want something that's flexible. Uh, roads are going to have good access, fire resistant building materials. And then let's look at the foundations, rubber shock absorbers. So as the ground shakes, it doesn't, it, it absorbs the um, vibrations, so it's less likely to shatter. And the foundations are into, uh, you don't want to be in clay because clay fills with water and they sink. It's called liquidation, liquefaction, sorry. And you don't want that to happen. So you need to look at what you're putting the buildings on. Problem is, is that's all quite expensive. And if we have a look here, this is what they've done in some um, low income countries or developing countries. We tend to use the term low income countries. Um, and if you have a look here, um, the diagram, so this part of it up here is just using some examples. And then if we look here, these are some of the building materials that they have used. So they think about what's called the gables. That's the end of the buildings um, and they're relatively light uh, structures. So and if you look inside, it's quite hard to see here, but they're, they're sort of like a, a braced together to keep them in position. Um, if we look at the second section here, we have quite light roofs, so maybe a thatch uh, 
or maybe very very thin sort of corrugated iron so that if they collapse it's not going to injure people by the weight of it and very very small windows again because um, that will create a weak spot in the wall um, if we look at the third section here of the buildings uh, they'll often have a bamboo frame again that's quite light um, and then you look at the sort of surrounding materials outside of the house uh, and then lastly um, here okay they they were used like old rubber tires as their shock absorbers so on the previous slide where we had really ma major shock absorbers this might just be rubber tires so it's about using any material that they have got Now volcanoes, as I mentioned, they're much harder to protect against because if you've got a whole load of um, lava flowing or lahars, which are your mud flows, um, debris, pyroclastic flows, all of these things, you can't really outrun it. And if there's a, a huge fire coming your way, then your home is going to be engulfed. So the main way that they protect people is actually they just help people evacuate, provide them with a safe location. So just like before, this time what I want you to do is with those statements, I want you to highlight in green all the statements that relate to the protection of earthquakes and volcanoes. So put yourself on pause and do that now. OK, so hopefully you've managed to complete those um, and you've got now um, what's that? Uh, seven of these eight statements here all about protection. OK, so now we're going on to planning. Now, with planning, uh, what happens here is that these are the actions taken to enable communities to respond to and recover from earthquakes. And this is about knowing it's going to happen, but having that plan. What I mentioned before, when I said about in um, Japan on the 1st of September, so everybody knows what to do about it. Um, and there's a little bit of an article here if you want to have a look and have a look at the uh, disaster prevention map there, if you want to just do a bit of further information. So earthquake planning, well, they need to think about what you do with your, bit, your furniture. So in your house, you want to make sure they're secure. You don't want high bookcases that are going to go topple, topple on you. So what they do is they often have like a strap so that they'll fall slightly um, because if they're too rigid, like I said before, they'll, it will fracture and break. But if it's got a bit of flexibility so the bookcase can move with it, you need to know where your emergency supplies are. You need to know where your evacuation centre is. You need to know where your food is. So then you'll have emergency supplies with you. You know, we've just noticed that supermarkets run out of crazy things like toilet roll and pasta. Well, you need to have things for that because your supermarket probably will run out. So you have a disaster box and you'll have tinned food. Don't forget your tin opener. You'll have bottled water so that because your water supply may be cut off. You'll have the medicine that you need as well as the first aid kit. Um, and you'll all know where those are kept and every family member will know where it is. Imagine you've come home from school and there's an earthquake and mum and dad aren't home from work. You can't necessarily be able to even ring them on the mobile because quite often the satellites will go down because it'll just be emergencies. So you'll need to know where everything is. And the organisation, so in America, because they have a lot of earthquakes, they have the American Red Cross and they basically will help people prepare for this. Um, as I mentioned before, the emergency services and individuals all know, and so it's so it can be calm. There was um, an article, not an article, it's a film clip that I watched once about an earthquake in America, and basically people were walking around stunned, and the local police were basically saying to people, go home, it is daylight, you are not going to have much daylight left, there is every chance electricity will be turned off, street lights will be off, go home now, get to your, or get to your places of safety, stop walking around in the days wondering what to do, Go and take action now. Um, residents learn how to turn off the main gas, electricity and water supplies. Just like I said in Kobe, this is important because you don't want the gas pipes exploding um, with the falling electricity cables and you need the water supply uh, available for the emergency services. Very, very simply, they practice drop cover and hold on. Um, obviously, a table isn't going to massively protect you, but if something is falling, it will protect you first. It will buy you time. Volcano planning is slightly different. They have to practice advice how to cover their eyes, nose and mouth to, pretend, to protect themselves against the gas fumes. They have exclusion zones. So what they'll do is I talked to you about an exclusion zone uh, the other day when we were talking about Mount St. Helens and how people inside that zone were told you know, don't go there. And they did. 
um, but they will be predicting saying these are areas that you shouldn't go. Uh, the authorities emergency services are prepared um, and basically the most effective planning is to have a good evacuation plan to know where people should be uh, and to know that they should be as indoors if possible because they're less likely to be affected by the gases. Um, but an evacuation route, if you look at that bottom right hand picture, it says clearly evacuation route so people know where to go. They're not panicking about which direction. They know that that's the safe place to go and people living in that area will be prepared for it. OK, so lastly, you need a blue highlighter now and I'd like you to highlight the terms related to planning of earthquakes and volcanoes. So put yourself on pause and do that for me. OK, so you can see here the areas in blue. Uh, four of these now are our planning and what we can do to plan for these events. Now, you may have noticed that there were a couple of blank spaces there were question marks, a bit of a challenge here. Can you find uh, another couple of either prediction, protection or planning strategies that you can add um, and let me know of any that you find? OK, so the last learning objective was about to evaluate the effectiveness of these strategies. There are three. OK, we have got prediction, protection and planning. And what I'd like you to do is decide where you would put them on that line. So which one of those three do you think is most effective? And which one do you think? So if you thought, for example, that prediction was the most effective, but not completely effective, you might want to write it here. OK, obviously, I'm hoping you'll write a bit neater, but you get the idea. OK, and you decide where on that line you are going to put from most to least. The second task there is I want you to evaluate them. I want you to be able to come up with the advantages and disadvantages. None of those are perfect. So tell me about prediction. What is an advantage of being able to predict, but what is a disadvantage? What are the advantages of protection? What are the disadvantages? And then the same for planning. Bit of a challenge there. Would your most effective method be the same for a low income country and high income country? And give me a reason, justify it. And lastly, just consider these things. Earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. At best, all of the current prediction methods only give a few seconds warning. Hazard maps can give residents a false sense of security. They might think it's okay, but actually their area is still quite dangerous. China evacuated the city of Haichang, one million people in 1975, partly due to the strange behavior of animals. Days later, a 7.3 earthquake struck. Drills are of no use if they are not known and followed by everyone. And experts know where earthquakes are likely to happen, but struggle to establish them. So establish when. So using that information as well, I'd like you to think about which of those is the most effective again. So think, I asked you to do that before on that continuum, that line. I want you to think here, has it changed and justify your choice. I want you to choose the most and why, only one this time. Okay, so that leads on to the quiz. All right, well done with some great answers that I'm getting from people from last week. Um, as always, make sure that you complete the quiz uh, after you've done this PowerPoint and done all the activities. Uh, there's a few more questions on there this time. The last question doesn't have any right or wrong answer so whatever answer you pick should be recorded as correct okay so have a good week everybody and i will see you next week